Shane Boone from BDI, who will be presenting on NDE and materials testing for bridge deck condition and service life assessment for asset planning. Uh, this is some work, it's based on a case study for a, a structure on the East Coast under NDA, can't, so we can't discuss the specific structure, but a uh, very large signature structure, 10,000 feet long, uh, four lanes in each direction. Um, and it's a project that we did with WSP and Infrasense. And the, the goal of the project was essentially to get as much data as we could about the bridge deck so that then WSP could take that data and ultimately come up with an asset management for the, for the span. And what we ended up finding was the structure, the deck itself was, was in pretty bad condition. So being able to have all that quantitative data to really plan on how we would project the life of the, of the structure was very important. And so I'm gonna go through that and all the technologies that we used. Mike Brown from WSP is typically my uh, co-presenter on this one, but he wasn't able to make it out. So I'm gonna struggle through the second phase of this presentation and I apologize for that in advance. Essentially, the presentation itself is broke up into two parts, my part and Mike's part. And the first part, we're talking about NDE in general, the degradation that we see with bridge deck. So if you know a lot about NDE, I apologize because I'm going to go into some of the specifics of the methodologies that we used. If not, maybe it'll be interesting for you. Um, and how we've used those that phasing of the technologies to come up with goals of how we approach doing deck inspection as a whole. I'll talk about the data collection that we got from the specific bridges and or specific bridge and the results that we then passed on to WSP. And that gets into the part two where those results were used for condition assessment modeling and the life cycle analysis that ultimately went back to the client to identify how they could preserve this structure in the best way possible. I'll talk about dis uh, conclusions and discussions apparently. We can have some questions if needed. In general, nine times out of 10, if we have concrete bridge degradation, it's most likely due to the corrosion of the bars. Obviously, you know, there are other methods of degradation such as loading or ASR or freeze thaw. But for the most part, what we see is a degradation to the steel rebar and subsequent spalling and delaminations. Through that phasing, we can actually test during each phase of that degradation. So from electrochemical testing to test if the bar is in a corros corrosive environment to using ground penetrating radar to identify if we have any cross-section loss or precursors to degradation such as moistures or chlorides through ultrasonics and sounding infrared thermography to identify if those rebar have put the concrete in tension and ultimately caused a spall. And then ultimately we can see those spalls with visual inspection. So we use a, a, a multitude of different technologies to kind of capture all those things. So what we're typically used to is just capturing it at the last phase during chain drag, right? That's what we're typically, it's like the kind of the golden standard that we use. Well, what we're missing during all that is all of these different phases of the rebar degradation where we could use that data and actually plan for when we want to preserve our structures, our, our assets. And so we can go through this whole phase without interrupting traffic by using high-speed GPR, in infrared thermography and high resolution video and, and now we have mobile sounding technologies as well. After we've done that, if we want to go on to a, a third phase and, and do some material sampling to really get the, the resolute data that we want to identify chloride profiles and things like that for condition assessment, we can. The goals are essentially to use these methods, these NDE technologies, to rapidly test our bridge decks um, and identify that data so that we can predict future deterioration and identify service life. We have the ability to do large square foot of deck, where, whether it's a signature structure like what I'm going to discuss today, or if it's large quantities of inventory across different spans statewide. This provides the owner the ability to have that data so that they can know when they want to preserve their struck. We drop this into kind of a phased approach. So essentially the first phase, we need this data, very, very high level screening. This can be through reviewing MBIS data and, and identifying how old the structures are, when they were last maintained. We can actually do aerial based infrared and do entire corridors in day's time to identify just kind of a high level screening. Then we get into the infrared, GPR and HRV. We can do this on a network level or very quickly without interrupting traffic on signature, signature structures. And then we can get into the phase, phase two and three where we're taking actual data on our deck, where we're getting what we're used to, the sounding, the material samples, the chlorides. And then we get to preservation where we can either do traditional preservation or some type of monitoring. 
So the first phase, I'll, I'll skip the phase zero because like I said, it's typical MBIS, what we've been doing for years. But the first phase we use air coupled GPR. So these are GSSI ground, air coupled antennas drive posted speed limit across the bridge deck to be able to determine if we have any precursors for degradation. And we can simultaneously collect infrared and high resolution video. If you're not really familiar with GPR, essentially we're send sending electromagnetic waves into the bridge deck itself. It's very good for identifying areas of, of good rebar, the cover of the rebar itself, and if we have areas of potential degradation. So these areas that we're, we see this attenuation of the signal, essentially what we're seeing is a precursor. So maybe we have chlorides or moisture in that layer. Maybe we have cross-section loss. So it gives us the ability to identify that we have something that we need to pay attention to moving forward. Also, we can identify very specifically on a high statistical bias rebar cover, which we need for our corrosion modeling. Infrared thermography, pretty crude figure here, but it gives you the idea, essentially, if we have an intact structure, the structure is going to be able to absorb the, the thermal energy put forth to it by the sun. If not, we get reflections from that thermal energy and we can detect that fairly easily. So we can identify areas that have deterioration versus uh, video. Now, one good thing about taking the HRV and the infrared at the same time is if, for instance, you have a puddle, now we have these two that are geospatially located directly next to each other. So we know that this indeed is an area of delamination, not just, for instance, paint or oil from a, a passing vehicle. We can use all that data specifically on the HRV to identify areas of spalling, patching, whether it's HMA patching or concrete patching, and we can automatically identify the quantities of those patches very easily. So states that have moved to uh, doing their element level condition rating based on percentage of the deck that's either patched or spalled, this can be done at highway speed and given an exact measurement in an automated fashion, which is much quicker, much more reliable, and much more repeatable than just simply sending out crew to, to do it manually. We can also overlay the data from the GPR to show areas of future degradation and areas detected by the infrared that are showing areas that are currently delaminated. Now keep in mind this structure, these are actually examples from the structure that I'm going to discuss in a minute. This deck was very, very, very heavily degraded and so these figures that you're seeing with all of this area of delamination, most of it was actually gone back and validated so this isn't just typically don't see this much delamination when we're doing these types of surveys. Uh, like I said, we can also use GPR to get the cover depth and get a very good statistical bias of, of where we are with cover so that when we go through and do the statistical methodologies for the chloride concentrations, uh, we, we know where we are with regards to modeling the depth itself. Deck acoustics response, this is, I've been doing this for a while and going to state DOTs and talking about GPR and infrared. Certain states have had good results with it, certain states have not. The golden standard, like I said, is always chain drag. So we wanted to develop a methodology that was essentially giving similar results. So. This is different than Impact Echo. We're not really looking for the frequency spike that you see with Impact Echo. We're at, we actually go through and, and we're trying to mimic what the human ear does, but on a more quantitative and reliable methodology. So the easier way is to just show how it works. So each one of these little black circles is essentially a microphone, and then you've just got hammer tapping. Pretty simple, right? I mean, we're, we're basically doing manual sounding, except we're doing it on a quantitative basis with computers listening that we can record the data. It's reliable, it's geospatial. We can go back and do it on the same deck that we did last year, and it's, all the data is going to be very repeated. Just to show you exactly what's going on, we have motor impactors. We can vary these, uh, the size of these spheres from six millimeters to 25 millimeters if, if the state is specifically concerned and the depth of the flaw itself. So those are interchangeable. The impacts are made at, at 40 milliseconds apart, so we don't have any acoustic crosstalk. Um, when we first started putting this system together, 40 milliseconds I thought was no time at all, but apparently for an electrical engineer, it's, uh, it's an eternity. So this is enough to avoid that type of crosstalk. And then the microphones are designed essentially to, to get rid of all the acoustic noise and isolate the energy that we want to, that we want to listen to. So primarily traffic noise. Obviously, we still get traffic noise, and so we want to filter that out. Federal Highway and a lot of other researchers have done a lot of research on air-coupled uh, acoustics. And the reason that we have to isolate that noise is because if you see this big circle of energy, that's the, that's the impact then we get leaky Rayleigh waves, which are surface waves that move across the bridge deck, 
And then these tiny little faint lines here are what we're actually looking for. We did our homework, did some research, identified how we wanted to isolate that noise, kind of did our due diligence to make sure that we weren't recreating the wheel and essentially developed this method, which is deck acoustic response. Impact Echo is always focused on finding an exact depth and a horizontal crack. We're, and sounding, you know, when we're using it with our human ear, we're identifying just that difference. That's kind of what we did. So we're, we're not doing impact echo, we're actually doing a different um, analysis methodology where we can identify where these flaws are. And then if we wanna go back, we have the data to do a traditional impact echo method. You can imagine that if you're gonna do 12 impacts, cause this thing is 12 feet wide and you're gonna do one every foot and you did a 10,000 foot structure, there's gonna be a ton of data, right? So how do, we, how do we get that to the point where we can analyze the data? So first of all, we have to filter it because if you see all these big black blotches, that's traffic noise. So what we're looking at here is the time domain uh, and amplitude of the impact. So each one of these straight up lines is an impact. Lots and lots of data. This is just a single time trace from about, I think about a minute worth of data. And then this is the time and frequency spectrum. So you see in the low frequency area, we have big blotches. We want to get rid of those. Filter the data, unfiltered data, filtered data. So we lower the noise floor. And then we can identify these areas that are very consistent with what we would see as humans or here to identify as degraded to concrete. Through this process, the, the research process, we, we did lots of manual chain dragging. We did lots of coring to, to validate that these are indeed delaminations. But again, the easier way is to just show you and let you listen. These, this is the noise floor where we're typically seeing traffic. Uh, this is the high area that it's getting too high frequency the, the human ear wouldn't typically hear it. And these areas in the middle are essentially right where the human ear would identify delamination. So like I said, repeatable and very reliable. Now uh, these little green dots are each one of the microphones. The black dot is the microphone to, for which we're gonna listen. Red areas are what are identified by the algorithm as a delamination. Uh, if it's not, it's just, you know, the high resolution video. And you'll be able to see that each one of these areas is very clearly a delamination. And I can play it if you want a couple times, but I think it only needs to be played once. Pretty consistent with what you would hear during the chain drag. So essentially, instead of having someone go out with a chain and a marker, we're now able to validate this the same way the human ear would be able to do it. And if we want to go back again, we can do the same exact methodology and see if those delaminations have grown or not. So we now have multiple data sets to essentially identify all of these thousands of impacts, we can go through, automate it, and it's a very quick method to identify where we have these degradations. Now, the next slide I'm gonna show is very scary, but again, remember that this deck was essentially in very, very bad condition. This is all the data overlaid. You've got areas of infrared thermography, lines up very good with the deck acoustic response, areas of GPR that also overlay with deck acoustics, and some areas that, that don't overlay. The reason for that is essentially what I started to be talk about at the beginning, where we have these different areas and phases of the degradation of the bar. So GPR is identifying, for instance, in this corner, an area that doesn't really show any delaminations with regards to the infrared. The infrared hasn't picked it up yet. It's not big enough for infrared thermography. But the deck acoustic response is starting to see a little bit about it because it's, it maybe is a small flaw that we need to worry about in the future. And then we get up through the point where we can see infrared is showing very clearly a lot of the areas that the deck acoustics is picking up that we need to fix. So showing that we can do this on a, on a high level screening program and do high speed inspection with GPR and infrared and screen our bridges and then identify which ones we wanna come through for that phase two inspection and do deck acoustics. Again, we get cover depth and this is getting into the, the second phase of this, of this presentation. So essentially to this point, what I've talked about is how we can collect all that data. Now I'm gonna talk about Mike's portion where we take that data and we can uh, analyze it for service life model for which areas we need to potentially uh, repair, replace, or preserve.
So with cover depth, we get a very clear uh, distribution of where the top map bars are. We get a statistical sampling from that GPR. And then essentially, we went through and did coring. We took uh, complete petrography, so we were uh, identifying pH, carbonation, um, and essentially what we were trying to identify uh, for the modeling portion itself was the chloride concentration as a function of depth. So through the GPR, we knew where our rebar layer was through our multiple coring and, and powder samples. We knew essentially the chloride concentration as a function of depth. And then we can go through a diffusion modeling process where we're essentially doing a Monte Carlo simulation, putting all of that information in uh, as the concentration and, and function of depth and identifying at what percentage and what year we would have certain chloride concentrations at that top mat level. Using all of that, we come up with what we call basically a coefficient of corrosion, and that gives us one last piece of the puzzle. We essentially went through, and now we have all these different data sets, essentially what we're calling our utility function with multiple data inputs from each one of these data sets that we took. So the SL is essentially the, the service life analysis based on the corrosion modeling and the chloride concentration um, as a function of depth. We have GPR, we have infrared, we have deck acoustic response, and we have high resolution video. And what you can imagine is that if, if you're wanting to know how to preserve your deck in, within one year, you're not gonna really wanna focus on the level of GPR reflections or possibly the chloride levels. You wanna know where it's delaminated now. So you would essentially put more weight on these K values for your infrared, your deck acoustics, and your high resolution video. And that tells you the areas that you want to repair now. If you wanna look at it at five to 10 years, you're probably not really concerned about the HRV where it's patched or spalled because you're gonna repair those next year. You wanna know where you, when you wanna repair them in five to 10 years. So you need to know what this service life prediction is based on the, uh, the corrosion depth and the corrosion modeling and the GPR identification, which is showing you essentially these precursors to degradation. So it gives you the ability to identify as a function of time when you want to preserve specific deck samples. And that's what we had to do because on this specific bridge, they broke it up into individual lanes and spans. So there were over, uh, I think, 145 different span sections, and they had to identify which ones they wanted to replace at which time based on all of this data. And before doing any of this testing, they had no idea. All they knew that was the majority of the deck was in very poor condition. They had no quantitative data to identify which deck sections to do before either one. And so we were able to take all this data, focus very heavily for the first first year on the HRV, infrared, and deck acoustics to identify which ones of these sections. So this isn't percentage of deck area. This is actually supposed to be number of, of deck samples. So for instance, you know, all these values don't add up to 100%. They actually add up to 145, I think. So essentially in the first year, they're going to replace 30 of those, of those sections. That was identified using very heavy weighted factors on the HRV, infrared, and deck acoustics. From there, we identified, okay, as a function of time and our corrosion modeling when do they need to when will they expect essentially the degradation to grow in these extra spans where they need to um, replace those sections and so we were able to identify okay if you use this model and, and repair and preserve these specific sections in this order we can get you out to about 14 years which the goal was to get to 15 years so we used the data and got them pretty much as close as we could considering the condition of the deck simple life cycle cost analysis so we're telling them essentially okay we're gonna repair it at this point, you get a little bit more service life, repair service life, and go through a function of, of using these data sets to identify when we wanna repair each section. And then it's essentially up to the client to identify what type of preservation they want to use. So we've seen a lot of presentations already this week or yesterday and today on different types of preservation uh, technologies and methods. So we give them the data sets to be able to identify when they need to preserve specific sections of a bridge deck, and then the client can essentially identify how they want to do it. Did we achieve our goals? Yes, we used conventional and NDE to identify you know, data sets so that we could predict future deterioration and service life by using these different technologies. Are we able to do this for large square footage of bridge decks? Yep, we, this specific deck that we did is 600,000 square feet. 
Uh, we, we've also recently deployed um, in a specific state to do 137 bridge decks in, in 30 days. So they were able to take all that data into their element level condition rating. And are we able to provide the, the owners the ability to proactively plan maintenance? Yes, we're giving them quantitative data sets so that they can then identify which bridge decks they want to spend their funding on. I'll take any questions. How long does the data analysis take? So after you do the, I guess, ND on the bridge deck, you said you did 137. What's the kind of the time frame for getting a product? So e each uh, method is a completely different technology to analyze. Um, the infrared is primarily visual, but we've done, uh, we've built in automated analysis programs that will identify it, and then we can just go back and do the QA, QC. The deck acoustic response is completely automated, so it's very quick. Then we just have to essentially put it into maps. The GPR by far takes the longest. Um, for this specific deck, it was 600,000 square feet, and we turned a report in, I think, a month. So big, big structure. Um, for the 137 decks, about the same. I mean, it, it's essentially once we get the data, we can start plugging in the numbers. It, it's really a function of drawing it in CAD and then overlaying everything. So pr pretty typical turnaround time. Could you go back to that? I think it was one of the first slides that had the uh, different techniques in the, if you will, the life of the deck. Mm -hmm. What I'm wondering, have you guys had any, you know, this deck had already been in service, so, you know, it had these deteriorations, but do you, do you have a deck right there, that one, where that first rebar corrosion, where you've had that overlaid on top of chloride sampling, to where you could say, all right, this is where the GPR picked up this, and this is what our chlorides were? Yeah, and so we, we actually had a pretty interesting project. It wasn't on a bridge deck, but it was on an elevated slab, so kind of the same thing. And this specific deck had been subjected for years to, to liquid chloride. They wanted to know which areas, they, they basically wanted to do a low rating. It was a two-way span in between a bunch of columns. And what we did was we essentially, we did GPR of the entire structure, and then we drilled in and physically measured pieces of rebar. And so we were able to essentially build an empirical model that was comparing uh, reflection amplitude of the GPR to cross-section loss, and then overlay that for them so that they could see what the actual rebar loss was. So it is possible to do that. It's a little hokey pokey because obviously, if you've got chlorides in the concrete itself, you're gonna get attenuation of the wave. So is the attenuation due to the cross-section loss or is it due to the chloride? So you've gotta use it on a conservative basis. GPR attenuation does correlate with cross-section loss. It's one of those precursors. So for years, um, and while I was at Federal Highway, you know, we talked about using GPR to identify delaminations. And luckily, the, the NDE industry has kind of moved away from that. It's no longer, no one ever really says that anymore. It's more that we are identifying these precursors to delamination. And that could be cross-section loss, and we could correlate it perfectly if we knew that there were no chlorides or moisture in the concrete. Unfortunately, we don't. Thank you so much, because I've always not being practiced in that area, the corrosion half cell potential. But I've heard that that's just experience talking to other people. It's not as reliable, if you will. Half cell uh, or GPR? Half cell. Initially, basically trying to keep that deck and, you know, identifying, uh, if you will, ahead of the curve when it's going to maintain good, what preservation treatment do we need so that we're not getting chlorides, we're not getting that initiation of corrosion. What tools do we have to, to identify that? It, it seems like in the industry, our, our tool is taking chlorides and sampling and it's all right, what other methods can we bring to that? I, I know Brian is gonna speak here in a minute. He's, he's definitely the corrosion expert over me. But with regards to doing electrochemical testing, you know, taking physical sampling samples like chloride is always gonna be your best bet. The issues that I've personally run into with regards to using electrical resistivity or, or half cell potential is, you know, do you have moisture in the concrete? Because that's gonna affect that, that half cell or, or that resistivity. Do you have a hot spot of chlorides that's a, a, essentially affecting that half cell and giving you a false reading for the entire structure, essentially. We, we tend to lean more towards GPR and acoustics and infrared. Essentially, if we find hot spots with GPR, then we go back and take physical chloride samples because at that point, we know what we're getting. The maps that you guys provide to the DOTs, I'm just kind of curious if the owners for, like, say, a deck rehab project are taking that map and coming up with quantities to put in bid items, or if you've actually seen the owners take that map and put repair limits on plan sheets uh, based on those maps. So we've done both. We have provided just the maps with, with the quantities based on, you know, the weird circles that is essentially what the data is showing, as far as providing maps with mapped areas of 
uh, estimated repairs. The clients then, to really answer your question, have gone as far as giving that to the general contractors as a limit for the, the contract material, or they've used it to estimate so they don't get into overrun issues essentially with the repair quantities. All right, thank you. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.